Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Joan Betorf, and I'm a professor in the School of Nursing here at UBC Okanagan and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention on our campus. So before we begin this morning, I do want to respectfully acknowledge that UBC Okanagan is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. I also want to acknowledge that some of you might be joining us from other places, both near and far, and I want to acknowledge the caretakers of those lands as well. So welcome uh, to once again, our ninth annual Okanagan Embrace Aging Month. We're nearly towards the end of the month, but we're delighted that we have a few more events before we reach uh, the end of March. Um, as you may have heard before, Embrace Aging is co-hosted by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention at UBC Okanagan, Interior Savings and Credit Union, and Interior Health. We launched Embrace Aging years ago to celebrate and raise awareness about positive aging. And we once again, as some, hopefully some of you have attended some of our previous events this month, um, and taken part in them. And so it's been a nice variety and really wholesome uh, variety of talks and activities. And as you may have found, the sessions are really designed for everyone, both young and old, and focus on a number of topics related to healthy aging and ways to improve quality of life for our seniors, as well as uh, family caregivers and really everyone. Our goal is to inspire each and every one of us to embrace positive aging. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping things. You might notice a closed captioning box on your screen. Uh, this can be moved uh, to uh, any place that you might find convenient uh, just by dragging it. Or if you find it distracting, you can close off the closed captioning with the live transcript button on your menu bar. We invite you to type in your comments and questions at any time during the session. We will have some time at the end of our, our talk today to read out those questions and, and have a conversation about this topic, this really important topic. And in the meantime, if you want to introduce yourself on the chat, please do go ahead. Um, Today's event is brought to you by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. And we are very delighted to have one of our own uh, talking with us today, Dr. Chris Boos, who is a senior research scientist with the Center for Environmental Assessment Research here at UBC Okanagan. So he's going to talk about the other health emergency, health equity and climate change in British Columbia, Canada. So welcome, Chris. Delighted to have you with us this morning. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Joan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that um, I'm really privileged to live, work, and play as an uninvited guest on the traditional and unceded territory of Salix Okanagan Nation. I um, would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I also want to thank the organizers for having me here today to, to talk about um, some really important work related to climate change and health and kind of situated in relation to everything that we've gone through in the last two years around the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, my orientation to this work today and the time that I have, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to assume that everyone is familiar with climate change or the impacts of, of climate change on human health. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, introducing some of the kind of key trends that we're seeing uh, uh, in the data. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the connections uh, between climate change and COVID-19 and think about um, how climate change actually might require a collective and commensurate response to what we, what we leveled uh, as a species uh, against COVID-19. Um, I'm then going to introduce why climate change is a health emergency um, by situating it in relation to um, this concept of, of health equity, which you may or may not be familiar with. And I'll illuminate it by sharing a couple of recent case studies that are relevant to British Columbia that are, that are especially relevant as we're heading into the summer months uh, and indeed fire season uh, here on the West Coast. I'm going to end with some closing thoughts on um, how we can go about addressing this problem. 
So the first part of this presentation is really meant to provide a brief update on, on climate change and health in Canada. And um, while my, my choice photo for this slide might seem a little bit bleak, again, our, our goal today is to kind of move from this picture of a province in the face of considerable uncertainty towards building a supportive community of actors uh, and communities and uh, public health and health system actors that are equipped with tools and processes um, that are able to engage uh, with climate change and health's complexity. So this is a, an image from National Resource Canada's 2019 National Assessment of Climate Change. And what it's displaying is the 2015 and 2016 winter temperatures. So average winter temperatures uh, in relation to the 1961 to 1990 so-called climate normals. What we notice when we plot those current winter trends is that the north of our country and indeed northern British Columbia is warming up to four times as fast as the rest of the country as a whole. We also know from that assessment report that Canada is warming roughly double the magnitude of what we experience globally in other parts of the, in other parts of the world. This is um, also from that same report. It's the projected change in annual surface air temperature for British Columbia. Um, this is a slightly different comparison. We're now comparing, comparing data from 1986 to 2005. And the results are showing um, future climate projections, future temperature projections, according to a couple of different on, what are called ensemble climate models. So this is groupings of a whole bunch of different forecasted elements compiled into a single model to project out and, and try to make sense of different future possible warming scenarios. The ones that are shown on this slide are RCP 2.6. That's what's referred to as the low emission scenario and RCP 8.5, which is the high emissions or business as usual scenario. And what we find out of these modeling uh, scenarios is that even in the best case scenario under RCP 2.6, again, this is assuming a, a very rapid transformation towards a low carbon uh, society, we can still expect temperatures to rise by about 1.6 degrees uh, towards the end of the century. Um, however, the pathway on the right, RCP 8.5, which is again kind of assuming the business as usual trend in greenhouse gas emissions, um, is the one that we're currently on. And this is really the, the kind of worst case scenario, which is forecasting as much as a 5.2 degree temperature raise uh, by the end of the century uh, across our, our fair country. And this is really a path that holds um, mid and long-term potential for really catastrophic warming that will fundamentally alter Earth systems on our planet. And it's, this is really not an overstatement. This is what's led more than 500 municipalities across Canada to declare climate change a climate emer emergency. And this isn't to say that we can't take action. We can, and it needs to be rapid. Um, the World Resources Institute has actually conducted some modeling um, and based on current rates of fossil fuel consumption, and emission, they've uh, ascertained that we have about a, a carbon budget of a little less than 10 years uh, to stave off the worst of, uh, impacts of climate change, which is to say we've got 10 short years to really rapidly transition uh, towards more renewable sources of energy, more types of low carbon um, building supplies, uh, and other both mitigative and adaptive uh, technologies to limit the worst of climate change. Basically what this slide is showing us is that our mitigation efforts are happening far too slowly. Uh, and this is true for most countries around the world. Um, and it's the fact that we're mitigating too slowly that's really leading us to increasingly experience a variety of ill health effects of climate change, um, which are really a, a mix of worsening of existing environmental health outcomes and the creation of new ones that are listed on this slide here. Um, and it's really not a question of when these things will happen. Um, this is happening around the world. It's happening in Canada as we speak. And we know that future warming is a high likelihood uh, to drive more health outcomes of significant consequence into the future. And importantly, uh, not everyone is going to be equally exposed, physiologically sensitive, or have the ability to adapt to these changing health circumstances. And this is why um, uh, climate change is really posing as a health equity challenge, which I'm going to come back to and discuss in a moment. So during the height of the COVID-19 lockdowns in early 2020, you likely saw a variety of different um, and really interesting media stories that were looking at massive improvements in air qualities uh, or in air quality uh, in major metropolitan areas around the world. Uh, even social media photos of a clear picture of the Himalayas from northern industrial cities uh, in India. 
Um, the figure on the right here is actually showing that from April to May, we, we did see some, uh, some reductions in carbon dioxide emissions from COVID-19 related lockdowns. But the current analysis is actually suggesting that we only experienced a small reduction in CO2 emissions between 2020 and 2021. We also know that pre-COVID, we were roughly tracking on, again, what's referred to as that business as usual, high emission scenario reported on by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And this COVID pause, which is exemplified in the chart on the lower left of this screen, um, that little pause in emissions is really likely to be a blip as leaders um, are, are increasingly racing back, um, in Justin Trudeau's words, to bring the economy roaring back. And without suitable foresight, the trajectory on the bottom left is really what we're roaring back to. Again, this, this trajectory towards climate calamity. And you can see that we've got a really bad track record of slowing greenhouse gas emissions in the wake of economic crises. So again, in terms of mitigation, uh, many of you likely heard a few years ago from, uh, from the Paris climate meetings, uh, Justin Trudeau and Catherine McKenna aspirationally wanting to limit climate change warming uh, to 1.5 degrees. And I say aspirationally because at the time that they were making those commitments, we knew that a lot of that warming was already actually locked in from past and present emissions. Um, that said, even the most recent modeling is suggesting that even if we are able to limit our, our, our future warming to 1.5 degrees, we're still facing a relatively stark picture uh, of our climate future. And the image on the right here is showing um, both left and right hand projections for global mean temperatures, maximum daily temperatures and nighttime temperatures. And really what this is showing is that both sides of that image are equally likely in a 1.5 degree warming world. Um, which is to say that even if we successfully mitigate and hold our global temp temperatures to 1.5 degrees, we still need to adapt our infrastructure, our health systems, our services for these two equally likely scenarios. And so this is really what's referred to as adaptation, really thinking about the, the potential future world that we're going to be living in and how we can design different systems and structures to adapt to that change in temperature. So again, mitigation and adaptation, two sides of the same coin, they both uh, uh, demand our attention. So let's talk a little bit about some uh, interlinkages and overlaps with COVID-19. These are obviously both uh, enormous, global, complex public health challenges. Uh, and indeed, based on what we know about the origins of the COVID-19 virus, both are also tied uh, to an increasingly unhealthy relationship to the natural world. In terms of scope of impact, um, uh, when I last looked last week, we had about 476 million cases of COVID-19 globally, more than 6.1 million deaths. Uh, and the UN is, is projecting that this uh, pandemic is going to cost global economy roughly several trillion dollars. By comparison, um, the WHO estimates that historically and recently, there are already about 150,000 climate change attributable deaths every year. It's projected to increase uh, to about 250,000 deaths per year by 2030 uh, and out to 2050. And it's also estimated to cost our health sector uh, literally billions of dollars per year, not including other sectoral impacts in, uh, that speak to things like disaster response, sanitation, upgrading um, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and indeed, a, a recent OECD report uh, reported that heat-related deaths could cost about $320 billion in 2030, um, uh, uh, in 2030 and up to $670 billion by 2050. Um, some recent modeling is actually suggesting that those WHO estimates are probably only just scratching the surface. There was a recent publication uh, put out in the Lancet Journal for Planetary Health and it looked at um, mortality from non-optimal temperatures between the year 2000 and 2019. And what it found was that every year, just due to non-optimal temperatures, i.e. extreme cold and extreme heat, there are 5 million deaths uh, uh, per year that can be attributable back to those climate phenomenon. So that's not even including the full array of climate-related health impacts. And all of this is really what's prompted uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to claim that climate change devastation could actually be many times greater than that of COVID-19. So when we're thinking about some of the kind of key similarities between these, uh, these overlapping health emergencies, we know that both are going to have local to global impact, both require considerable urgency uh, to be addressed, and both have significant implications for our most vulnerable populations, yet we've never actually seen the kind of rapid action we've taken on a global scale to combat climate change as we have with COVID-19. And it's likely because COVID-19 is still something in our minds that, that's relatively highly urgent, 
Um, whereas despite the fact that people are being uh, already harmed from the health impacts of climate change, it's still seen as something in the future, something that we actually only have a little less than 10 short years to figure out uh, before facing the potential for runaway, uh, runaway warming. So let's now kind of move in and unpack a little bit about what this equity di dimension looks like uh, in terms of climate change. Um, climate change really, it, I mean, it touches just about everything that we do in my field of environmental public health, and, and it cumulatively overlays and maps onto just about every pressing public health challenge that we face at present. And I think that this is really uh, wonderfully demonstrated by Margaret Chan's quote on this slide, um, where she indicates that climate change is the defining issue for public health in the 21st century. I mentioned when I shared that slide on health impacts that we also know that um, deaths and illnesses are not going to be evenly distributed across a population. And this has really been um, cause for, for myself and colleagues uh, across the country to name climate change as a potential threat multiplier uh, in a recent chapter on health equity in the uh, recently released Health of Canadians in a Changing Climate Report. And I'll share some information about that summary report a little bit later in the presentation. But the long and the story here, uh, the long and the short of the story here is that those most unable uh, uh, to adapt are more likely to be vulnerable to climate change and health impacts. And those most impacted are typically the least responsible for creating climate change challenges uh, and often face systemic and other intersectional health challenges at baseline. So what do I mean when I, when I use this frame uh, of health equity? Um, we often think about uh, equality in outcomes where everyone kind of either gets the same dose of intervention or that we're striving for everyone to have the same outcome across the population or between population groups. And equality really means, uh, per the image on the left here, everybody gets to ride the same size bike, irrespective of ability, of size, of gender, uh, of identity, you, you ride the same bicycle. Equity is about people getting the dose of intervention that makes sense for their life circumstance. In other words, we're really kind of trying to strive to attend to the unfair and largely avoidable distribution of ill health outcomes on certain populations. So kind of following this logic, inequities are precursors to inequalities. Inequities speak to the broader conditions under which inequalities are enabled to exist in the first place and persist over time. And the reason why climate change is a health equity issue is because it interacts with multiple different types of determinants of health through a variety of direct and indirect pathways. And you can kind of see on this slide here that uh, this is again um, some uh, infographics that were pulled from the national assessment um, that climate change really interacts with upstream determinants of health um, and really thinking about some of the structural conditions for how we uh, design our cities, the pre-existing state of health outcomes and the pre-existing state uh, of how resources are distributed across our society. Um, they also interact with a variety of vulnerability factors. So social cohesion, people's ability to access services and resources, um, especially high quality care. Um, we also know that there's a variety of climate related exposures and pathways and ultimately what we're trying to do is, is build systems that prevent people from accessing those acute care during the, during the uh, times of emergency. It's not to say that we don't still require really robust um, uh, climate uh, um, uh, acute care uh, facilities and acute care services, we absolutely do. Um, but in the, the 10 short years that we have to adapt, we need to be thinking about how we bolster our health systems and how we also design other systems that prevent people from getting sick um, so that we can keep people from accessing those services in the first place. The other thing that we know is that um, knowledge of climate change is actually already rapidly increasing uh, here in Canada. This is uh, some results from a survey of Canadians on climate change and health. And it's, uh, it's heartening to see that 79% of the surveyed Canadian population think that climate change is happening. Um, but even more than that, 93% of those who were surveyed actually think that climate change is a current health risk or that it will be one in the future. The challenge that was uncovered in that national assessment report is that that increased knowledge, that increased understanding of the evidence of the health impacts of climate change is not necessarily being translated into um, productive and proactive action in ways that could potentially mitigate um, some of those harms. So we certainly see a variety of people are becoming better at checking things like weather alerts, um, but only about half have taken action um, because of hearing a heat warning. So irrespective of checking the weather to see what it's like, still one in two people are not necessarily just taking protective measures during an extreme heat event. Uh, and even fewer actually have an, uh, an emergency household plan. 
So overall, that that uh, the stat on the bottom here around climate pre preparedness, only about 37% of people who were surveyed uh, expressed that they'd taken actions explicitly to protect themselves from health, uh, the health risks of climate change. And these are numbers that we need to see increase. We really need to start thinking about how we bolster preparedness uh, in ways that attend to some of these equity factors. And some of the ways that that's being done across Canada is this kind of leading or current practice in public health of, of conducting so-called uh, climate change and health vulnerability assessments. Um, these are an attempt to understand how health inequities might be exacerbated. And for those of you who haven't heard this word in the context of climate change before, I figured a, a little bit of an uh, overview or backgrounder might be helpful. So uh, vulnerability is really a function of, number one, the degree of climate-related exposure. We can think about that as like a dose of extreme heat or a dose of extreme weather. Um, and number two, a person uh, or population's physiological sensitivity um, to those particular exposures. Uh, and it, all of those are moderated by their adaptive capacity or their ability to adjust to changing circumstances. So for example, we know um, that seniors, older adults, are more physiologically sensitive to things like extreme heat. Um, we sweat less as we age. We may be on certain medications that make us more light or heat sensitive. Um, we're also more likely to have uh, one or more chronic conditions uh, according to Canadian averages. And in some cases, we may be more dependent on caregivers uh, to take adaptive actions. So the question in light of that kind of portrayal or, or, or really quick uh, depiction of vulnerability is, how then do we adapt? Well, one of the, the uh, resulting implications might be that we try to find cool or shady spaces. And if air conditioning is the answer, hopefully it's not being uh, powered by fossil fuels, which will only further exacerbate our future exposures. And this is just a little bit more of a kind of a, a complex graphical depiction of what I just shared. But uh, the reason I like this image is that it shows how equity is implicated as a mediating factor all along the causal chain from a, a climate driver through an exposure to our health impacts and our health outcomes. And it really highlights how different structural issues of poverty or racial discrimination can exacerbate or worsen existing inequalities. So the little infographic bubble on the top left there, we know that again, because of those vulnerability factors in general, um, there are a variety of different populations that have been classified as more or less vulnerable to a variety of different climate change related impacts, uh, particularly in terms of health. Uh, and again, the, the point that's being made here is that when we're tracking that chain of, of a climate driver, that ultimate climate change, um, how it's signaling either an increase in events or, or, or an, a change in conditions that's precipitating more health outcomes, uh, especially ill health outcomes, um, we can kind of see when we, when we layer that language of vulnerability onto this figure, um, where health equity actually has the opportunity to, to, to worsen based on some of those structural conditions. So you can see kind of a couple of different examples of exposures and sensitivities and adaptive capacities on the left, thinking about issues of poverty, um, occupational status, uh, racial discrimination, and how those things might actually modify um, who is more or less exposed to a particular climate-related phenomenon. When we're thinking about sensitivity, we might be thinking about the distribution of underlying health disparities. And remember that a health equity lens is really asking us who bears a differential, the differential brunt of pre-existing disease? And are those health outcomes avoidable? Uh, in, in other words, are they unfair at baseline? Because climate change is likely to worsen or, or exacerbate them. And then when it comes to adaptive capacity, thinking about kind of the, the broader societal structures at play here, which might mitigate or, or um, uh, reduce um, a, a person or a population's ability to take protective or proactive actions uh, in the event of a, a climate-related um, uh, uh, forcing. Um, so issues of poverty, education, social norms, um, health and economic policies all play a really significant role uh, in terms of those health impacts becoming negative health outcomes. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I, I do think it, this is an important aspect of the conversation um, that we're having right now about equity and fairness uh, in light of climate change. And what this slide is actually communicating, um, this is the, uh, the, the global wealth pyramid of uh, using 2018 data. Um, and what it's actually showing is that um, uh, those who are least responsible for climate change actually bear the greatest impact. Remember that this is a global picture, but these results can certainly be extrapolated and applied to the Canadian context. We know that in 2018, the world's top three 
national emitters. So these are countries, the top three countries in the world contributed 14 times the emissions as the bottom 100. And when we look at this at the individual level, this figure actually demonstrates how the top 10%, the top 10 wealthiest percent uh, of people on the planet owned approximately 84.1% of global wealth and produced about half of the planet's individual consumption-based fossil fuel emissions. While the poorest 50%, about 3.5 billion people on our planet, contributed only 10%. So that's a five-fold difference. Um, we know based on really robust evidence in the field of public health that more equal societies tend to fare better on almost all social, economic, and health outcomes. And even in spite of this knowledge, we've actually widened inequalities globally. Um, so this is what a lot of people uh, refer to when they're talking about climate justice, that a lot of, uh, of wealthier individuals, wealthier countries are more responsible, contribute more to the problem um, than they do in terms of actually contributing to solutions. And the folks who aren't contributing to the problem vis-a-vis -vis their actual um, uh, uh, contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions are the ones who are most vulnerable to the impacts. So again, this is a huge question of fairness, a huge question of equity, and a huge question when we boil it down to the, uh, to the level of, of health impacts, um, of thinking about how we can um, uh, continue to justify this system, but also think about how we actually embolden people and empower people um, to take protective action and build systems and, and governance structures um, that reduce some of these societal inequities. So I, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and, and having kind of uh, painted a picture of what vulnerability to, to climate change looks like, I want to share a few case examples that are relevant to British Columbia uh, in terms of how vulnerability uh, to climate change manifests and how some of our public health systems and actors are responding to these challenges. This is really important. Um, I, I wanna start by talking about wildfires because wildfires raise uh, a variety of issues. The first being significant transboundary challenges uh, for us in public health where the upstream problem, the actual physical fire may be uh, located beyond our specific jurisdiction. This is actually a photo of the 2018 fires uh, in Northern British Columbia. Um, these were fires that were uh, located just west of the city of Prince George where I was living at the time. Um, and uh, in 2018, during this fire, August 15th, uh, the smoke was actually thick enough to black out the skies of, uh, of Prince George at 10 o'clock in the morning so that street lights had to come on to illuminate uh, uh, the streets because it was so dark. Um, move 700 kilometers due east to the city of Edmonton. And uh, that same day, uh, several hours later, this is what the air quality in Edmonton looked like from that, that wildfire. So again, we're, we're dealing with this, this challenge of climate change and wildfires are this great exemplar of how climate change is in and of itself a transboundary issue, irrespective of where the actual uh, cause, in this case, the fire is, that climate driver. Um, the, the resulting impacts, the resulting risk to human health can sometimes be carried hundreds of miles away to diff different jurisdictions with um, uh, uh, different actors and different um, levels of adaptive capacity. So let's fast forward a little bit to the summer of 2020. We know that we had uh, numerous West Coast cities experiencing uh, air quality alerts and setting poor air quality records. Uh, it was important to note on this slide that um, the US air quality index is measured a little bit differently from how we measure air quality and health in Canada. Um, but uh, it, certainly during the time that this photo was taken in Vancouver in September of, of 2020, Vancouver was experiencing what's, what's referred to as air quality health index days of greater than 10. That's the, the absolute highest, the absolute maximum uh, of the scale that we use to measure air quality in Canada. And what you can see here is that Vancouver rated really high. This is um, uh, the US AQI level above 300 is considered hazardous um, and exposed people at high risk of, um, uh, puts people at high risk of eye irritation, uh, breathing problems uh, and other adverse health effects. So what else do we know then about wildfires and human health? Well, fortunately it's an area that's actually seen some really good uh, production of recent research evidence uh, here in both the Canadian and the North American and context. Um, we know, uh, for example, that wildfire smoke contains uh, a variety of different chemical compounds, including ozone, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, polycyclic uh, aromatic compounds, nitrogen dioxides, and most importantly, part particulate matter. Um, uh, and we tend to see, as a result of those forcings, 
increases in cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and respiratory emergency departments uh, visits and deaths uh, during wildfire events in, in adjacent communities or in places um, where the prevailing winds are carrying um, thick and dense wildfire smoke. In Canada, uh, some recent modeling is actually suggesting that wildfires are contributing uh, not only to really significant physical health effects, and there's some, been some really great work um, led by Warren Dodd and Courtney Howard, um, looking specifically at the mental health effects of, of living under um, uh, constant evacuation notices uh, from wildfire, uh, as well as dealing with the fallout and, and living in um, areas where you, you can't go outside in the summer uh, because the air is not healthy to breathe. Um, we also know that the, uh, these events are happening, or they're, they're having at least a, a greater impact on human populations. And um, some work that we did for the Lancet Countdown uh, on climate change, um, we looked at forest fire data that was collected between 1980 and 2017. And we noted that more than half of all Canadians evacuated uh, during that age range actually happened in the last 10 years. So these things are happening um, in greater proximity to human settlements, and they're, um, they're certainly uh, increasing uh, potential health risks. Um, while we know that the uh, well, long-term effects of chronic exposure are still largely unknown, we do know uh, in BC, based on some um, really great recent modeling work um, uh, out of the BC Center for Disease Control, that we get a really strong signal for health service utilization for um, uh, respiratory and cardiovascular outcomes within one hour of exposure to wildfire smoke, and these can also exacerbate diabetic outcomes. So let's take a look at, at what public health uh, is trying to do and some, some innovative approaches um, to how we're trying to conceptualize and understand vulnerability and how this can actually influence um, the practices and protocols that we put in place um, to in enhance preparedness. So this is actually a, a, a perspective analysis. It's based on historical data, but it's, it's looking at multiple levels of vulnerability, again, according to exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And this is a, some mapping work that was done by um, Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, so the darker areas on this map are actually indicating greater vulnerability measured by the factors on this slide. So our exposure is actually exposure to the number of uh, PM 2.5 uh, days that with uh, greater than 25 micrograms of concentration. So these are these are like really bad air quality days, high levels of smoke in the air, um, and they've modeled that over the la the the five most severe fire seasons uh, between 2009 and 2018. In terms of sensitivity, they've actually mapped out uh, down I think to the level of sense the um, census tracts the proportion of children. Um, the proportion of the elderly who are age 65 plus, and people who are living with pre-existing chronic uh, conditions. Uh, and, and so again, raising the fact that uh, we know already from the evidence that wildfire smoke is going to exacerbate and worsen some of those conditions. And we know for a variety of reasons that children um, and older adults, uh, and, and particularly people with, with pre-existing uh, uh, and chronic respiratory di disease, things like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmon pulmonary disorder, tend to um, experience the health effects uh, worse than a, than a healthy adult. Um, in terms of adaptive capacity, they also looked at um, income and social status, uh, education and literacy, and social supports and coping skills, um, uh, somewhat as a response to what we know about, again, the mental health impacts of climate change, the ability to digest information and translate it into, into action uh, as but a couple of examples. And what we see is that this is a really kind of powerful example uh, of a geospatial and statistical analysis tool to inform um, uh, future action. So looking at some of those dark blobs, what the logical question that kind of follows on this slide is, so what now what? How do we actually use this to engender a, a, a new orientation towards our planning? Um, and we know that as a part of this process um, um, that we're not necessarily far enough along, but um, Vancouver Coastal and Fraser, to their credit, have started as a result of this work to do some really interesting work around seasonal readiness planning. And they're, they're really kind of thinking through how is it that we reach the broadest, the, the broadest population? How do we need to retail our communication messages and the health risks, especially of wildfire smoke, um, to some of these darker areas? Um, and, and really kind of thinking through what then are the types of, of practices and protocols that we need to put in place? Are there clean air shelters that we can be developed just like we develop with uh, extreme heat uh, uh, locations and, and facilities? Um, so the nice thing about being able to understand how vulnerability is depicted in a particular region is that it, it then enables us to target and direct resources towards the people who need them the most.
So let's take a look at a, a retrospective analysis. I'm going to share two examples of extreme heat vulnerability to climate change. Um, and and uh, I'll draw especially um, uh, from two recent examples, the first being the 2018 heat wave um, that struck the city of Montreal. Uh, city of Montreal experienced about 66 heat-related deaths following a long bout of hot weather, um, something that's increasingly expected to become the norm. I'm also going to share some recent results from the BC heat dome um, that, that struck uh, and impacted our province in 2021. So in terms of what we know about extreme heat and human health, we know that temperature is actually a very strong predictor of morbidity and mortality in Canada. We know that depending on where you live uh, across the country, thresholds uh, for heat-related illness can be as low as 26 degrees Celsius before we start to see increases in background levels of illness. Um, and we also know that heat is obviously going to be um, uh, um, or worse in pre-existing uh, uh, conditions. So a couple of things that we found, um, you know, or that we find in the literature is that high temperatures impact um, our, our, our body's ability to thermoregulate. And there's a variety of different health impacts that are associated with extreme heat, from heat rash, heat cramps, heat fainting, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and dehydration. Um, really importantly, all of those conditions actually worsen pre-existing cardiovascular, circulatory, and cerebrovascular conditions. And there actually is some evidence that suggests that they, they may extreme heat may also worsen respiratory conditions. We also know that while this isn't necessarily um, an urban-rural issue, it's, it's really one of surface cover, um, but research has actually found that non-permeable surfaces, so we think um, uh, things like concrete, buildings, anything that's not covered by natural land cover, those surfaces can be 10 to 15 degrees hotter than those covered with natural land co cover. Um, and we also know that there's this phenomenon called the urban uh, heat island uh, effect, where air temperatures in urban areas tend to be one to three degrees higher, um, precisely because of that difference in, uh, in land cover. So in terms of Montreal, this is uh, this is kind of what we confirmed uh, uh, around kind of place uh, of residence. And apologies for those of you who don't speak French, but I'll walk you through this. Um, the the slide coloring that you're seeing on the left these are these are what are called um, the, the kind of the degree you can think about it as the degree of urban heat islands. So the the degree of natural land cover um, versus uh, areas with higher concentrations of impermeable surfaces. Um, so that little blue blob uh, kind of in the middle of uh, the island of Montreal is, is the mountain of Mont, Mont Royal, so large open green space. And you can kind of see that the rest of the surrounding city tends to be predominantly red. And what the, that retrospective analysis found, uh, again, um, is that 66% of the people who passed away from exposure to extreme heat, they were located in these heat islands uh, within the city. We also know that 72% of the people um, who passed away had pre-existing chronic conditions. So low income and socialization isolation were, were the two most important aspects of heat wave mor mortality. And it's really kind of a, um, this type of analysis is really a testament to the power of some of the epidemiological tools that we have in our tool, tool belts. Um, but again, raises the question of, well, then how, how is it that we go about preparing for the next extreme heat season? And how do we do that in ways that are mindful of local context and local vulnerabilities? Um, we also know um, uh, that in the wake of the BC heat dome, there were a variety of health effects that we experienced here in 2021. This is a, a figure from the coroner report and associated statistics, but we know through that week of June 25th and July 1st, where heat was um, it, at its most extreme, the province experienced about 526 deaths. 96% of all of those deaths happened in a residential se setting, and individuals who are aged 70 and over accounted for almost 70% of all mortality events. Um, notably, we didn't experience any heat-related deaths among children, but um, we did find that the highest rates of mortality were in the Lower Mainland. Um, again, uh, giving um, some evidence to that um, uh, urban heat island effect. This has really led the BC Ministry of Health to, to kind of consider a variety of different things. And we, and we know um, from some work that I'm participating in them with them right now, um, this has actually led to a review of heat guidelines, um, particularly in long-term care facilities and investigations into um, facilities and really thinking through um, uh, how and whether to upgrade certain mechanical cooling uh, capacities in long-term care facilities um, so that we can be better prepared for what we know are going to become uh, increasingly normal events. This is some analysis um, also of the BC heat dome that comes from Sarah Henderson at the BC Centre for Disease Control. This is kind of a, an environmental epidemiological analysis of community deaths uh, during that heat dome event. 
And what um, Sarah and her colleagues did was, was created this combined index, just like we saw in those in the vulnerability maps for extreme heat or extreme or for wildfire smoke, I should say. Um, they created this combined index of material and social deprivation and, and found that it was highly predictive of, of mortality. Um, you know, heat dome deaths um, basically uh, were largely attributable to people who did not have the, the adaptive ability um, to, uh, to change their circumstances. We saw a lot of people who were living alone, um, uh, especially um, who weren't being checked in on by family members or friends. Um, and ultimately perish due to extreme heat. Um, we also know that um, from some of this work that, that Sarah's produced that uh, indoor temperatures in, in one of the illustrative uh, homes without air conditioning uh, range between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius uh, during the heat dome event. Um, so really the conclusions that, that's being drawn from this work are that risk of death during the heat dome was associated not only with, with social deprivation, um, but also lower neighborhood greenness, older age, um, and that high indoor temperatures likely played a really significant role. So the public health response now really needs to be focused on, um, you know, what are the most highly deprived neighborhoods um, and what are the neighborhoods or households with low uh, mechanical cooling solutions uh, during extreme events? And how is it that we can kind of, kind of promote um, better access and utilization of cooling spaces during these events and also urban green space um, to, to uh, again, enhance the overall level of natural land cover that, that uh, um, helps to reduce the urban heat island effect. So really, you know, uh, coming back to that definition of equity, equity needs to be about what's, what's fair and what's right in kind of a moral sense. It needs to be how we take care of ourselves and how we build our systems to be attentive to the diverse needs of other different populations as well. And so the last thing I wanna say on that, that kind of point of vulnerability is that, you know, there's a lot of literature, including my own research, that's really kind of problematized this term. You know, despite its uptake as leading practice, I really argue that vulnerability assessments are still very much based in this kind of detriments model of health impact assessment um, that actually might run the risk of further marginalizing different differentially impacted population groups. Whereas coming up with other novel approaches such as uh, climate justice, which we've heard a little bit about, um, intersectionality theory, which really kind of aims to be a little bit less essentializing of, of, of particular people's social identities, um, might actually be able to better consider some of the unique identity factors and the, the resilience that individuals and communities have. And that would actually enable um, public health actors to learn from different groups of people around the types of strategies that they take that enable them to successfully adapt to a variety of different climate-related harms. Um, so again, we know that from our, our recently published health equity chapter in, in Canada's national assessment that there, there are a lot of ways that we can address vulnerability um, by engaging communities and recognizing the pre-existing challenges that they face, attempt to replace pattern behavior that perpetuates uh, inequities um, by acknowledging and, and listening and, and meeting people where they're at and, and doing that in ways um, that empower them to become agents of change to address climate change. And so to end, I, I want to just pose a challenge to everyone. You know, we, we know that in the wake of the wildfires and floods and heat domes that we're experiencing more and more across our province, the country, and indeed the world, this idea, um, especially in light of COVID-19, of bouncing back has really been emphasized, to return to a state uh, of, of, of system functioning prior to a given acute event or shock. And the question I want to pose to you all is whether bouncing back to an inherently unequal society that is structured to further disadvantage the already disadvantaged is the society that we want to live in, or whether we can actually do better. And the thing I like about this figure on this slide is that it actually indicates our capacity uh, to, to not only deal with disturbance, um, but that it's a direct outcome of the choices that we're making uh, today. The challenge for us in climate change is to, first and foremost, avoid the collapse of our systems, including the overwhelming of our healthcare system, um, but also avoid recovering worse off than we were before. And so a, a lot of people, uh, especially those in public health, are starting to question the idea of recovering to a pre-event state. We're also kind of asking whether racing back to restart a system that requires significant carbon inputs um, and only benefits really the wealthiest and, uh, members of our society and is driving us unsustainably towards ecosystem collapse. Is this really a smart idea? So the goal here is to really kind of think about um, not just about recovering, but how we can actually transform our systems and our structures and consider our priorities um, collectively as a species moving forward.
So a couple of resources that I've mentioned that are worth sharing, uh, just as I tidy up here. Um, the first is uh, Health Canada has released their Health of Canadians in a Changing Climate Report. Um, this is the, uh, kind of the country's most comprehensive synthesis of research evidence on climate change and health to date. Really strongly encourage you, you look at it, there's a variety of resources, infographics, report chapters, fantastic figures, uh, and, a, and a really great collection of experts that contributed to the development of that report. Um, the second thing is I, I'm, I'm actually working with the BC Ministry of Health to conduct um, uh, Canada's first ever provincial baseline assessment of health systems resilience to climate change. We're going to be releasing some summary documentation of, the, of our findings in that report, uh, a, a report format uh, in May 2022, so it's something to look out for. Um, and the other thing, recognizing that this is an embracing aging um, seminar, um, there are a lot of uh, uh, really great resources that are uh, uh, available for older adults to think about taking adaptive action. There's a really great uh, not-for-profit organization listed here that shares resources uh, and opportunities to get engaged. So I'd encourage you to check their, uh, their website out for more information as well. So thanks so much uh, for the kind attention today. I'm, I'm happy to take some questions in the time that we've got left. And, and of course, uh, would welcome uh, opportunities to hear uh, from people via email. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out. Wonderful. Wow, what a great presentation. Thank you. You uh, really provided us with a lot of information uh, today. So thank you uh, again. Uh, there are already a couple of questions um, in it uh, in the chat. The first is from our colleague, Gord Lovegrove, and he's just asking for uh, some citations for the slide on the Canadian survey. Um, do, you re do you recall what that might like, be? I, 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 I'd be able to pull it, Gord. If you send me an email, I'm happy to share it with you, but this is the infographic that was developed as a part of the national, um, the national assessment report. So all the citations would be able to be found uh, directly uh, in that particular document. Um, but just to clarify too, Gord, I think the, the two numbers, 79% uh, are convinced that climate change is happening, 93% um, feel that climate change is a current health risk or will be one in the future. I'm wondering, Chris, in that survey, did they, did they also ask if people were doing anything to actually reduce on their, in their own initiative to reduce the effects of climate change? Yeah, it's, it was mostly a public perception survey from my understanding, Joan. And it, I mean, it's, uh, again, one of the things that Joan and I were, were chatting about um, just before people were joining the call was this recognition on not only the Canadian scene, but internationally, that we've actually, there's a dearth of evidence on what works really well. We're, we're trying to implement a variety of different programs to respond, not only to acute events, but also to think about that broader context of preparedness. Um, but because it's still early days for public health as a discourse, we're, we're kind of learning as we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, there, we're really, there's, there's limited ev evidence that we can draw from at baseline, let alone evidence that would be highly contextual and applicable um, to specific locations. And that's one of the kind of complicating factors of vulnerability to climate change is that it is so localized. It's dependent on local geography. It's dependent on local um, social and economic conditions uh, as well. Yeah. I found it really interesting. I hadn't realized that green spaces in a city had some potential protective factors for people in a heat wave. And so, so that is kind of interesting to think about. Um, and also this idea of, you know, ensuring that people have access to cooling uh, centers or even in their residence, care homes, whatever, the opportunity to stay cool. And so it is an interesting idea um, and obviously one that could really help a lot of people. And so what are the options for cooling that don't actually create more of the problem? In that. Yeah, well, we're, we're really fortunate in British Columbia that the vast majority of our energy actually comes from renewable power sources. We're, we're one of the few provinces in Canada that don't rely on fossil fuel energy to produce electricity. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that, you know, using mechanical cooling isn't necessarily a risk to exacerbating future climate, uh, future climate change. There's a variety of really great resources for individuals uh, on uh, uh, like the, the Fortis website and the BC Hydro website for um, low uh, or, or high energy efficient cooling solutions. Solutions. Things like heat pumps are being pushed really, uh, really widely right now. Um, a really highly effective way uh, to both heat and cool a home uh, in a variety under a variety of different temperatures. So there's a variety of new kind of technologies that are happening. The other thing, Joan, on your point, the the, the power of green space. We we know that this shows up in a couple of different ways. And obviously, when we're thinking about 
um, human health, what's more important than just having natural land cover is having shade, having canopy that's actually reducing uh, both ultraviolet radiation and then, uh, you know, not necessarily um, uh, allowing heat to get trapped in heat, uh, um, heat absorbing materials like concrete. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever walked outside on a hot day and step and touched your bare hand or bare foot to a, a black tarmac, you know that it's going to be 10 to 15 degrees hotter than the air temperature. You might burn your foot. So the whole idea is how do we actually, and that, that heat just continues to radiate up and, and, and back towards people. So that's where the tree canopy aspect becomes really, really important um, because obviously we just can't cover uh, giant swaths of land with low lying trees shrubs, it wouldn't be highly effective, especially given the way that our current systems are, are set up. But thinking about comprehensive, um, uh, uh, some municipalities are developing comprehensive urban forestry strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the things that the city of Kelowna and other municipalities across BC are starting to consider. What are, what are the best quality uh, shade trees that are going to do the best under a variety of different future climate change scenarios? And again, the, the challenge here is that we're going to be planting things that we want to live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and they're going to need to be resilient um, to those future temperature changes. Um, so urban forestry strategies are one of these things that are highly effective. The other thing that I didn't mention in my presentation, Joan, that's really relevant to that question is um, where do we get the most bang for our buck in terms of co-benefits? And urban forestry is one of these really interesting opportunities that not only protects us from extreme heat, but it provides a natural carbon sink. So we get to absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's going to play a mitigating role. Um, it's also going to protect us uh, from things like flooding. Um, the, more, the more we plant, the more actual resilience we've got to localized flood events. Um, they also, greening provides, you know, obvious opportunities for people to recreate, get outside um, and be connected to nature. So there's a significant mental health benefit there as well. Yeah, that's great. Good. I, I have been planting a tree every year, so I'll keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how can, uh, there's a question from uh, Susan, how can as individuals make sure we are doing what we can to help with climate change? within and outside our homes. And maybe you've already answered that. Um, I don't know. I'm going to we'll tackle it again, Joan, because I think this is a hugely important question. And I, I, I love that people are impassioned and want to take, uh, take this on as an individual responsibility. There's a lot of things that you can do individually to reduce your carbon footprint. The first thing I'd encourage Susan and others to do is actually go online. There's, there's a dozen different carbon footprint calculators that you can use and figure out where your individual source of emissions is actually greatest and develop some strategies as to how you can reduce those. The challenge, and I don't want to get people off the hook for mitigating their own impact, but the challenge is that even collectively, if we all work, um, and we're particularly bad in Canada, we've got very high per capita GDP or uh, uh, per person emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, but we also know that the vast majority of emissions are not coming from specific individuals. They're coming from um, large sectors such as the energy sector, the oil and gas. So all those efficiencies are certainly important, but the most powerful thing that we can actually do is continue to advocate to our elected representatives to take meaningful action, institute things like carbon tax, institute things like polluter pay legislation uh, to make sure that profits are, 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 are appropriately being redirected back to not only mitigation, uh, but also adaptation uh, well into the future. Sure. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, Gord uh, says, I see on one of your first slides the horrible transportation contributions to GHG's climate change, second only to our Canadian energy sector. So to your point in increasing choice and resilience, I totally agree. I wonder if you could speak to transit, not just in cities, but in longer trips between cities. I'm thinking you and I may be climate justice allies on pushing to reintroduce regional intercity zero emission passenger rail. I like this question a lot, Gord, and it's an interesting <laughs> one. The, the slide that I was sharing earlier was a global picture. Um, so that was, you know, globally, uh, the, the mix is a little bit different in terms of greenhouse gas emissions nationally. Um, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think transport uh, is, is roughly somewhere between um, 11 and 13 percent of global. I'd have to look up the number, Gord. It's, it's significant. It's a high proportion of overall, uh, overall emissions um, uh, nationally. Um, one of the things that I was kind of uh, a little bit flabbergasted to learn about um, is a single transatlantic flight from Toronto uh, over to London is basically equivalent to an individual's entire carbon footprint for all the other things that they're going to do in their life, driving their car, eating their food, going about using transit, etc. Um, so air travel is absolutely one of the things that we need to, we need to figure out greater efficiencies in. 
um, and, and make sure that we, if, if, if again, the rise of telecommuting and COVID, if it's taught us anything, we can have really productive, interesting conversations remotely. We don't need to fly to different cities to have an hour long meeting, just to turn around, jump on a plane and fly back uh, as fun and as exciting as it might be. So introducing some of those efficiencies into the system, I think is hugely important. I also think, um, Gord, to your point, exploring alternative mechanisms, especially for, for longer, um, longer trips. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening in rapid, in, in rapid transit and electrification systems systems um, for, uh, for large infrastructure projects. Uh, challenge always being that they're going to be expensive. Uh, any type of new, new technology is always going to be expensive, um, and they're going to take some time to build. We won't, we, so again, you know, we've, we've got these 10 short years. The question becomes, what do we want to be advocating to for our elected representatives? What, what's the, what do we want our infrastructure to look like in 10 years? And we need to start doing that advocating now. Um, it's, it's going to be too late uh, the longer we wait. Mm -hmm. I see I missed a question from Jonah who's asked, um, thank you for the informative presentations. I wonder if you could touch on emergency preparedness and prevention for wildfires in rural areas among older adults. Uh, and he asked with hoarding disorders, but I might also broaden that just older adults who are particularly vulnerable in rural areas who don't wanna to move to the cities um, and where wildfires might actually affect people the most is in those rural areas close to those. Yeah, areas. it's a great, and there's there's a lot of reasons why older folks choose to move to non-urban areas, right? Largely driven by affordability and um, uh, access to a variety of other kind of outdoor features. Um, the list goes on. Uh, Jonah, it's a really great question. I'd invite you to reach out to me uh, at my email. I'll, I'll pop in the chat box again, and I'd, I'd be happy to follow up. I, I lived in Prince George uh, for three and a half years, and um, I was running a research institute at a UNBC and had the privilege of traveling ar around and visiting a lot of um, BC's most remote, remote communities and lived through a variety of different wildfire seasons up there, and I think that your observation is quite apt. I think we also know that in terms of emergency um, response, not in terms of the prevention and preparedness aspect, we know that there's, there's, there are inequities across the province. We know it's harder to deliver services the more rural, the more remote communities are. Um, and really what that means uh, from a preparedness um, and prevention standpoint is thinking about the conditions for resilience now before se fire season is happening. So um, it, reaching out and engaging with your neighbors, having an emergency supply, uh, 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 an emergency response plan for your household, but also for your neighbors, um, checking in with folks that you know, neighbor checking programs have proven to be wildly successful and, I, and uh, certainly in urban areas, but they're, they're very scalable to, to, to rural ones as well. Uh, and just being able to reach out and provide support to people that you know might need it during a, a, an evacuation event or during a, a, a bout of, a, of poor air quality um, are all really small things that go a really long way uh, to enhancing individual health. But I'd welcome the conversation, Jonah. Um, so please do reach out. And I'll, uh, as Joan's reading the next question, I'll pop my email in the chat box one more time. I think you're right, uh, Chris, rural communities already. I mean, I grew up in a rural community. Everyone knows everybody. So there's already an infrastructure there for neighbor to neighbor support uh, just by all the social connections that exist in rural communities. They probably have a lot to teach urban communities about getting to know your neighbors. Um, so lots of thank yous and other comments about um, from Gord around uh, nationally from NZAB, transport is 25%, energy is 26%. You probably know what he's referring yeah. to. Uh, someone else, uh, cruise ships are another big polluting sector. Um, would you agree with that? I, I'm not familiar with the with cruise ships very much. Yeah, huge carbon outputs, um, let alone the, the impacts to um, aquatic ecosystems. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're not great. Yeah, of course, Gord is uh, saying it's cheaper and quicker to build a passenger rail line to than to widen and build new highways. Um, so a, a case in point there. Um, thank you for an inspiring and in-depth presentation. Well done. Um, there is also a, a question about whether the slides can be shared. So we will be posting this presentation on our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to, uh, and we'll send out that link um, to everyone who's registered and you're welcome to share it with colleagues and to view the presentation again. So I encourage you to do that because I know there was a lot of information packed into the presentation um, that people might wanna review it again. So I see that we're nearly out of time. Um, 
And so I do want to take this moment on behalf of everyone who joined us today to thank you very much, Chris, for sharing your work with us. It's really very, very informative and um, provides some useful directions for us all as we think about how we can advocate for more resilient communities in the future and perhaps even uh, take action to do our own part in in reducing climate change and uh, preventing uh, any ill effects of climate change um, as as is COVID, we're all in this together. So mm. thank you once again for by for every by on behalf of everyone here. Thanks so much, Joan. The pleasure was all mine. It was a, a, a pleasure to be here. Yes, and thank you for everyone who joined us today as well. And hope you get a chance to uh, come back and uh, join in one of our upcoming presentations. So bye for now.